This is BBC News, I'm Ben Thompson with the latest headlines for viewers in the UK and around the world. Ukraine's humanitarian crisis deepens with tens of thousands of civilians trapped in cities under near constant Russian shell fire. There's a fair amount of incoming fire coming into this now. Artillery fire, there are loads of civilians around. Ukraine's president condemns the attacks, saying those responsible for deliberate murder would never be forgiven. Who controls the country's largest nuclear power station? The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency he expresses his concerns. We travel with some of the refugees heading west, leaving their homes and belongings looking for safety. Ukraine's young cancer patients evacuated to Poland, fighting a battle for survival on two fronts. And Asian stock markets fall as the price of oil continues to rise as the war now enters its 12th day. Hello to you, a warm welcome to the programme. Ukraine's President Vladimir Zelensky has angrily condemned Russian military attacks that have targeted civilians. In a video address, Mr Zelensky said that those responsible for the deliberate murder of Ukrainians would never be forgiven. Tens of thousands of civilians are trapped in cities under near constant Russian shellfire. They lack food and other most basic needs. Well, for the second day in a row, an attempt to evacuate 400,000 residents from the besieged city of Mariupol, that's in southeastern Ukraine, has failed. A planned ceasefire broke down with both sides blaming each other. Our correspondent Sarah Rainsford is in the city of Dnipro, where officials had been preparing to welcome those who were fleeing from Mariupol. The head of the UN's nuclear watchdog says he's extremely concerned about reported communication difficulties between the Ukrainian regulator and nuclear sites under Russian control. Rafael Grossi said Ukrainian authorities were having trouble contacting staff at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. It is the biggest in the country. Well, a relative of someone who's working inside Chernobyl has spoken to the BBC. That facility was taken by Russian forces over a week ago. We've called her Valerie, which is not her real name, to protect her identity. She described to us the situation. Stay with us here on BBC News Still to Come. Get me to the checkpoints on time. Why armed conflict didn't stop this couple from tying the knot. This is BBC News, I'm Ben Thompson, the latest headlines. Ukraine's president condemns Russian military attacks that have targeted civilians. Vladimir Zelensky said those responsible for the deliberate murder of people would never be forgiven. The International Atomic Energy Agency says it's concerned about reports Ukrainian authorities are having trouble contacting staff at nuclear plants that are now under Russian control. More than one and a half million people have now left Ukraine since the conflict began. That's according to the United Nations. They've described it as the fastest growing refugee crisis since the Second World War. Some of those fleeing have acute needs with cancer patients having to leave their hospitals with treatment interrupted as they seek safety elsewhere in Europe. Our correspondent Mark Lowen has been hearing some of their stories in Poland. Well, during an emergency parliamentary session on Ukraine last week, Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz announced drastic measures that would have been previously unthinkable, including an additional $113 billion for the German army. It is arguably one of the biggest shifts ever seen in Germany's post-war foreign policy. 
Before the invasion of Ukraine, such a militaristic stance would have been unacceptable for most Germans. But in a recent poll, 78% agreed with the transformation in foreign policy. Damien Grammaticus sent us this report from Berlin. Well, as we've been discussing this morning, the Russian invasion of Ukraine is causing chaos for millions of people. And yet, in the midst of all that, two people on the front line have decided they won't let war get in the way of their own plans for life, as the BBC's Tim Ullman explains. Uh, we'll have all the latest business headlines coming up for you in just a moment. You can get in touch with me and the team. I'm on Twitter at BBC Ben Thompson. We'll see you very soon. Bye bye. If you've got questions about the stories making headlines, Reality Check is here to help you get the facts straight. Our team of experts examine the evidence and cut through the spin. Join me, Chris Morris, here on BBC World News, or go to bbc.com forward slash reality check. This is BBC News with the latest business headlines for viewers in the UK and around the world. Oil prices soar as the US and its allies discuss banning imports of Russian crude. Rushing for the exit, the list of multinational companies leaving Russia continues to grow as it becomes increasingly difficult to operate in the country. And the boss of the world's largest fertilizer producer warns of higher food prices as the conflict and sanctions hit supplies of key ingredients. Hello to you, a very warm welcome to the programme. We're looking at the implications of the war in Ukraine and what it could mean right around the world because oil prices, first of all, have soared to levels not seen since 2008. And that is after the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, said the US and its European allies are now considering a ban on Russian oil imports. Well, Brent crude, that is the global oil benchmark, spiked to above $139 a barrel. It's currently hovering around the 130 mark. But Blinken also stressed the importance of maintaining steady oil supplies around the world. We'll look at the geopolitical implications in just a moment. Well, how would that oil ban fit in with the sanctions that have already been announced? Uh, we know the list of companies that are terminating their operations in Russia is growing. Technology, fashion, media and finance organisations, businesses in nearly every sector are deserting the country, either due to sanctions or increasingly because of pressure from customers. Well, this weekend, the card operators Visa and MasterCard, they stopped their operations. Today, we've learnt that American Express will now follow suit. Uh, well, as you'd expect, uh, Asian stock markets, they're in free fall after that oil price shock and the idea that there could be a ban of uh, imports of Russian oil. Let's take you to the numbers and this is what Asia is doing right now. You see the Nikkei nearly two and uh, three quarters of a percent lower, uh, similar picture in Hong Kong and their confirmation Brent at $129 a barrel. Uh, so let's talk about some of those implications with Mark Ostwald who's Chief Economist and Global Strategi Strategist at ADM ISI and um, welcome to the programme, thanks for being with us. So when you look at those numbers in Asia it feels like it could be another and we've said this before but it could be a really uh, rocky road on the markets today and this week as investors try and work out what those implications for a ban on Russian oil, Russian oil really mean. Uh, we'll keep an eye on that. Mark, thank you. Mark Oswald there, who's from ADM ISI. Uh, well, we told you a little earlier about uh, American Express, Visa, MasterCard, all suspending their operations in Russia. Uh, some local banks, though, are now considering a shift to a rival system, to China's union pay system instead. Well, Nick Marsh is in Singapore for us. Uh, Nick, just bring us up today. How would this work? And it's quite a shift. Yes, uh, it's telling, isn't it? Um, Nick, for now, thank you very much. Nick Marsh there, live for us in Singapore. 
Uh, time to briefly bring you up to date with some of the other business headlines today. China has set its economic growth target at 5.5% this year. That is the slowest pace in nearly 30 years. In a report to the annual session of Parliament, Premier Li Keqiang said the economic stability must now be a top priority. That, of course, as the world's second largest economy faces a growing number of challenges, including inevitably the war in Ukraine, but also a debt crisis in the property sector and faltering consumer confidence due to its strict COVID-0 approach to the pandemic. TikTok has suspended live streaming and new content from being uploaded to its platform in Russia, citing the country's fake news laws. The video sharing giant said it wanted to ensure the safety of staff and users as it, as it assessed the implications of the new law. Since Friday, anyone who writes news deemed to be fake about Russia's armed forces can face a lengthy jail term. And Netflix says it's decided to suspend services to its nearly 1 million viewers in Russia. The announcement comes after uh, earlier this week the streaming giant said it had temporarily stopped all future projects and acquisitions there as it assessed the impact of Moscow's invasion of Ukraine. Uh, stay with us here on BBC News Still to Come this hour. The boss of the world's largest fertiliser producer warns of much higher food prices as the conflict and sanctions hit supplies of key ingredients. Uh, this is BBC News, the latest headlines. Ukraine's president condemns Russian military attacks that have targeted civilians. Vladimir Zelensky said those responsible for the deliberate murder of his people would never be forgiven. The International Atomic Energy Agency says it's concerned about reports that Ukrainian authorities are having trouble contacting staff at nuclear plants that are now under Russian control. The boss of one of the world's largest fertiliser companies has told the BBC that the war in Ukraine is a threat to global food supplies. Yara International operates in more than 60 countries and it sources many essential raw materials from Russia, which is a major supplier of nutrients. It also relies on huge amounts of natural gas from Russia too to power its plants across Europe. Well, its chief executive has been speaking to our business correspondent Emma Simpson just hours after the Russian government urged its producers to halt fertilizer exports. She began by asking him about Yara's operation in Ukraine, where its office building in Kyiv took a direct hit. The uh, boss of Yara International there speaking with our business correspondent Emma Simpson. Now, at least one million people have already fled Ukraine since Russia's invasion, that according to the United Nations. Some have warned it could be the biggest refugee crisis this century. So just what impact could that flow of refugees have on the European countries that are welcoming them? Uh, well, joining me now is Jolt Davas, who is senior fellow at the Brussels-based think tank Bruegel, Jolt, thank you for being with us. And of course, we should say, first of all, uh, it is so inspiring to see how many neighbouring countries have been prepared to welcome people who are fleeing the conflict in Ukraine. And yet inevitably, of course, questions turn to the impact that such an influx would have on those neighbouring economies. What is your assessment of the work that will need to be done to be able to support people who are fleeing conflict? Uh, yes, and it feels that this problem will get much worse before it gets better. Uh, Jolt, thank you for being with us. Thanks for your insight there, Jolt Davas, who is Senior Fellow at the Brussels-based think tank at uh, Bruegel. Uh, so we touched on uh, the market reaction to everything that we've seen, particularly as far as that soaring oil price is concerned and that possible threat, that possible uh, ban on Russian oil imports that is being touted by the United States. They say they are working with European allies to see whether that is feasible. But remember, of course, the huge contribution that Russian oil and gas makes to the global energy picture. You can see Brent there at $129 a barrel. It's been soaring over recent days in Asia. No, the Nikkei and the Hang Seng, as you can see, both off by about 3%. Be interesting to see how Europe opens within the next hour or so. You're up to date. I'm at BBC Ben Thompson. Headlines coming up next. See you very soon.
This is BBC World News. I'm Ben Thompson. Our top stories this hour. Neither. Ukraine's humanitarian crisis deepens. Tens of thousands of civilians are trapped in cities under near constant Russian shellfire. There's a fair amount of incoming fire coming into this now. Artillery fire, there are loads of civilians around. The country's president condemns the attacks, saying those responsible for the deliberate murder of his people would never be forgiven. Who controls Ukraine's largest nuclear power station? The head of the International Atomic Energy Agency expresses his concerns. Asian stock markets fall. The price of oil continues to rise as the war now enters its 12th day. Stand with Ukraine! Stand with Ukraine! And as the fighting continues, so too do the protests. Demonstrations take place all around the world. Hello to you, a very warm welcome to the programme. We're going to start this out with an update, breaking news coming into us here at the BBC. This is being reported by both the AFP and the Reuters news agencies this hour, telling us that another uh, temporary ceasefire will begin. It's due to begin in around an hour from now. I, uh, the idea to allow uh, several key cities, uh, including the capital Kyiv, uh, but also Kharkiv and Mariupol to allow civilians there to leave the cities, uh, those cities under intense bombardment from Russian attacks. Um, now it's worth saying we have heard this before and these promises of a ceasefire came to very little. This would be the third promise from Russian forces that a uh, ceasefire would be introduced to allow people to leave often from the bunkers underneath buildings that they've been hiding now for many days. The head of the UN's nuclear watchdog says he is extremely concerned about reported communication difficulties between the Ukrainian regulator and nuclear sites that are under Russian control. Rafael Grossi said Ukrainian authorities were having trouble contacting staff at the Zaporizhia nuclear plant. It is the biggest in the country. Well, a relative of someone who's working inside the Chernobyl site has spoken to the BBC. That facility was taken by Russian forces more than a week ago. Now, we've called her Valerie. It's not her real name, but we want to protect her identity. She described the situation. Well, during an emergency parliamentary session on Ukraine last week, Germany's Chancellor Olaf Scholz announced drastic measures that would have been previously unthinkable, including an extra $113 billion for the German army. It is arguably one of the biggest shifts ever seen in Germany's post-war foreign policy. Before the invasion of Ukraine, such a militaristic stance would have been unacceptable for most Germans. But in a recent poll, 78% of Germans agree with the transformation in foreign policy. Damien Grammaticus centers this report from Berlin. Stay with us here on BBC World News still to come. A country united. We meet some of the volunteers in Ukraine trying to help those on the front line. This is BBC World News. I'm Ben Thompson. The latest headlines. Reports from Ukraine that another temporary ceasefire will shortly come into effect to allow people to leave several key cities. And the International Atomic Energy Agency says it's concerned about reports that Ukrainian authorities are having trouble contacting staff at nuclear plants that are now under Russian control. As the fighting intensifies, buses and trains continue to arrive in the western Ukrainian city of Lviv. As people leave their homes and their belongings and prepare to seek sanctuary elsewhere, our special correspondent Fergal Keane has been travelling with some of those who have fled. Within hours of Russia invading, volunteers began to mobilise all over Ukraine. The BBC's Jana Bezpiatchuk has visited one community centre in the west of the country, where locals have been working around the clock to ship up to 100 tonnes of food and medicine out to the front line every day. 
Uh, so as promised, uh, we're going to take you now live to Kiev and our correspondent there, who is James Waterhouse. Uh, James, it's good to see you. Um, and look, within the last half hour, we've had further updates. We are told that a ceasefire will take place uh, to allow civilians to leave. But it is not the first time we have heard this promise from the Russian authorities. James, look after yourself for now. Thank you. Our correspondent James Waterhouse there in Kyiv. And just to remind you that ceasefire due to begin in the next half hour um, to allow people to leave several key cities, including, as you can see there, the capital Kyiv. BBC World News, I'm Ben Thompson. Our top business stories. Oil prices soar as the US and its allies discuss banning imports of Russian crude. Rushing for the exit, the list of multinational companies leaving Russia continues to grow as it becomes increasingly difficult to operate in the country. And the boss of the world's largest fertilizer producer warns of higher food prices as the conflict and sanctions hit supplies of key ingredients. Hello to you, a very warm welcome to the programme. We're looking at the implications of events in Ukraine that are being felt right around the world, including on the oil markets, because prices of oil have soared to levels not seen since 2008. That after the US Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, said the US and its European allies are now considering a ban on Russian oil imports. Well, Brent crude, the global oil benchmark, spiked to about $139 a barrel. It's hovering this morning at around 130 But Blinken also stressed the importance of maintaining steady oil supplies around the world. We'll look at the geopolitical implications of that in just a moment. But first, what could it mean for all of us, for the cost of energy, for homes and businesses? Well, Nathan Piper is head of oil and gas research at Investec. He told me about Russia's contribution to world oil supplies. Supplies. Nathan Piper has been to me a little earlier. So how would that oil ban actually fit in with sanctions that have already been announced? Well, the list of companies that are terminating their operations in Russia grows by the day. Technology, fashion, media and finance organisations in nearly every sector are deserting the country, either because of sanctions or increasingly because of pressure from customers. This weekend, the card operators Visa and MasterCard stopped their operations. Today, we've learned that American Express have now followed suit. Well, I spoke to Rebecca Harding, who's the boss of Coriolis Technologies, and asked if it was just a matter of time until other franchises pull out. So those are sanctions and businesses pulling out. But as we've said, it's oil prices that are really being uh, felt right now. Let's show you what uh, Asian markets are doing. And this is the current state of play, as you can see. The Nikkei there in Tokyo and the Hang Seng in Hong Kong are both off by three, three and a half percent. But it is that oil price now at $129 a barrel for Brent that is proving to be such a big problem because quite rightly in its own right, it has huge implications for the cost of many things, but even down to the level of shipping uh, and getting things into store as well as we'll talk about this a little later uh, things like fertilizer and factory production costs as well uh, and I put some of those thoughts to Mark Oswald who's a chief economist and global strategist at ADM ISI he told me his view of how markets are reacting to that suggestion that Russian oil exports could be banned by the US well, after American Express, Visa and MasterCard all suspended their operations in Russia. Some local banks are considering a shift to China's union pay system instead. I spoke to our correspondent Nick Marsh in Singapore, asked him how it would work. Nick Marsh there in Singapore for us. Let's bring you up to date with some of the day's other stories because China has set its economic growth target at 5.5% for this year, the slowest pace in nearly 30 years. In his work report to the annual session of Parliament, Premier Li Keqiang said the economy uh, must be stable and that is their now their top priority. TikTok has suspended live streaming and new content from being uploaded to its platform in Russia, citing the country's fake news laws. Since Friday, anyone who writes news that's deemed to be fake about Russia's armed forces can face a lengthy jail term. Uh, stay with us here on BBC News still to come. 
The boss of the world's largest fertilizer producer warns of higher food prices as the conflict and sanctions hit supplies of key ingredients. This is BBC World News, the latest headlines. Reports from Ukraine that another temporary ceasefire will shortly come into effect to allow people to leave several key cities. And the International Atomic Energy Agency says it's concerned about reports that Ukrainian authorities are having trouble contacting staff at nuclear plants that are now under Russian control. The boss of one of the world's biggest fertilizer companies has told the BBC that the war in Ukraine is a threat to global food supplies. Yara International operates in more than 60 countries and sources many essential raw materials from Russia. It is a major supplier of nutrients. My chief executive has been speaking to our business correspondent Emma Simpson. He spoke to her just hours after the Russian government urged its producers to halt fertilizer exports. She began by asking him about Yara's operations in Ukraine, where its office building in Kyiv took a direct hit. That's the boss of Yara International speaking to Emma Simpson there. Now in Ukraine, at least a million people have already fled the country since Russia's invasion. That's according to the United Nations. Some have warned it could be the biggest refugee crisis this century. So what impact could that flow of refugees have on the European countries that are welcoming them? It's a question I put to Jolt Davos, who's a senior fellow at the Brussels-based think tank Bruegel. So full headlines coming up for you at the top of the hour, but just time to uh, bring you up to date with that breaking news we've had within the last he hour here at BBC World News, uh, reporting uh, that there will be a temporary ceasefire this hour to allow people to evacuate certain key cities, including the capital Kyiv, but also Kharkiv and Mariupol. Now it's worth remembering this is the third time this has been promised, but nonetheless we are told a statement from the Russian Defence Ministry that it will allow people to leave the heavily bombed areas. You're up to date. Headlines up next season. Now on BBC World News, the latest business news from across the globe. World Business Report. Prices soar as the US and its allies discuss banning imports of Russian crude. And rushing for the exit, the list of multinational companies leaving Russia continues to grow as it becomes increasingly difficult to operate in the country. Hello to you. This is World Business Report. Hi, I'm Ben Thompson. Now, since Russia invaded Ukraine, the West has largely avoided sanctions on the country's energy sector. It has focused instead on banks and individuals. But that could change as the US and Europe step up efforts to isolate Russia. On Sunday, US Secretary of State Antony Blinken said the US and Europe are having a very active discussion about a total ban on Russian oil imports. So lots of implications of that proposal. Asian stock markets, they have fallen pretty sharply. This is the current state of play. You can see uh, in uh, Hong Kong, markets down by three and a third. And it's also a similar picture over in Tokyo. And that is the reason why Brent crude at $128 a barrel. Uh, so many concerns. Let's talk about some more of those implications with Mark Oswald, who's chief economist and global strategist at ADM ISI. He is coming, I'm sure. Uh, nice to see you, hopefully. Um, talk to me about those big falls that we've seen on the markets because you see why investors are nervous right now. Oil at new highs and it doesn't show any signs of easing anytime soon, does it? Um, thank you for being with us, Mark. Mark Oswald there, Chief Economist and Global Strategist at ADM ISI. We saw you in the end. <laughs> uh, let's bring you up to date with some of the other stories from today because credit cards issued by Visa and MasterCard will no longer work in Russia from the 9th of March after firms suspended operations there. According to Russia's central bank, some local banks are now considering a shift to China's union pay system instead. Union pay is already used by some banks in the country and is reportedly enabled in 180 other countries. 
China has set its economic growth target at 5.5% this year, the slowest pace in nearly 30 years. In his work report to the annual session of Parliament, Premier Li Keqiang said economic stability must be a top priority. The world's second largest economy faces a growing number of challenges, including of course the war in Ukraine, a debt crisis in its property sector and faltering consumer confidence. And TikTok has suspended live streaming and new content from being uploaded to its platform in Russia, citing the country's fake news laws. The video sharing giant said it wanted to ensure the safety of staff and users as it assessed the new law. You're up to date. More from us and the team a little later. See you soon. Bye-bye.